So welcome to the Human Project, mm. your podcast for some inspiring stories. Mm. I'm here in Beirut and I do have the pleasure to sit with Roger Mukarsel. That's a good sign you start pronouncing my name good. <laughs> <laughs> That was difficult, huh? Mukarsel and with a lot of effort. <laughs> It's, it's late, it's actually almost 10 o'clock and I just asked uh, you, Roger, whether you would be happy to sit with me and instead of having our lemonin over there on the terrace to do an interview and you agreed. So thank you very much that you are here. You can have your lemon here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy that the mosquitoes leave me now in peace. Yeah, you know, the, I have tricks also because I traveled so much so I have tricks mm -hmm. for everything, even for the mosquito. <laughs> <laughs> so this is exactly what you are doing. You worked for the respected um, Sigma and Reuters, right? Yes. And you have been into photography since you have been 15 years old. Yeah, I started my career as a photographer at 15. Mm -hmm. I started taking pictures at 12. Mm -hmm. Like I stole the camera of my brother and I did some shots. Mm -hmm. At that time it was like a, a black and white with film. Oh really? Do you know films? Yes. Did you see that? Yes. I can show you that. If you Google uh, <laughs> analog uh, photographic film, you will have Kodachrome, I think. Mm -hmm. So I did uh, some shots and then my brother said, you should use it more. Mm -hmm. I was afraid in the beginning that he will shot on me. Then he said, you're going to use my camera more. So I use it and then uh, at 15, it happened that I shot things during an event during the uh, the Beirut war, Beirut war. We are now in which year? Because I think you were born in 1962. So I, I was born in 1962. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> we keep it between the two of us. No, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it was the war that started in 1975 here in Beirut? Uh, when the war erupted, I was 11, I think. Wow. Or something like that. And then uh, I became a, a journalist photography photographer journalist in the beginning at 15 and then I became a war a war photographer at 16 or 17 this is quite young uh, yeah but depend what do you mean by young <laughs> no the important thing so what does it mean like you became a photo journalist or a war photographer was it you said like you took pictures at the age of 15. And apparently they, um, they did something to others. And this is, yeah, they, they created an emotion, or they were seen by others. And this is how you turned more into photography, because you received some echo of your first work? No, I became into photography because I love photography. I don't mm. care about my mm. being seen or something. Of course I was happy that I was mm. published, but uh, this is the, the mm -hmm. image and the photography who was attracting me. So, uh, and then since then I'm a photographer, but I evolve, of course. Now it's too long the night. I have to travel in seven hours. <laughs> if you want me to, to, to talk about my life, it's going to be, we're going to need more, you know. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I was always attracted by photography and then I started my photography uh, to be a photographer and then it was a non-stop uh, evolving into that field. So, it was like you, s you could feel your passion for photography but not yet, um, you haven't yet received some publishing. Um, I was published at Orders. 15. Oh, you were? Yeah. Like magazines start buying my pictures at 15. It's young, I know. Mm -hmm. But you know, when you grow into the war, you become quickly uh, either uh, uh, completely uh, in a negative way or completely in a positive way. So you think differently and you care about things and you feel things in a different way. You know, war bring in you all the best and all the bad. Mm -hmm. And to be into a war or to be a war photographer, you need to be very strong and very uh, wise. Mm -hmm. If not, uh, you get killed very quickly first, so you don't have time to grow. Or you 
grow your mind in a quick way without damaging other things. This is a balance, you know. And uh, the more you are involved into war and into war photography, the more you, 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 you see things you should not, you know. Uh, you have fears. Normal people doesn't have it. So all this is an, uh, did do an accumulation of senses mm -hmm. in your head and in your body where you have to digest them because either either they eat your your mm -hmm. uh, sensitivity or they you you grow your sensitivity in a way. So. So you can become a, a crazy burned head guy, or you can become a very uh, a wise and sensitive guy. So it happened, I think, that I went into that direction. You know, there is a thin line always. There is a thin line between uh, crossing a, a, a certain things in your mind or uh, uh, digesting things in a way that you become stronger and in a way I became a big pacifist at the end. I didn't become a big warrior. And I think it's good. The picture that was published when you were not yet 16, what was it about? What did you capture with your camera? Uh, it was an event of a, a political party with a militia where I covered the the heads of the people. I did portraits of the people where you can see intensity and different look and different regard. So uh, apparently it was good. I don't have them anymore, but I don't remember them very well. But uh, it kept the, uh, a, a local magazine where the editor uh, bought them and used them. And then they start uh, commissioning me mm. to do other things. Then I became a Sigma photographer. How old were you when you started to work for Sigma? Uh, I was like uh, 18 or 19, 19 maybe. And I was still working with local magazines. And uh, then I became a Reuters photographer. How old were you when you started to work for Reuters? I was 23, wow. 22, 23, I think, 24, 21. I don't remember this. This was another, another uh, in another life. <laughs> yes, I remember when we spoken on the terrace. You yeah. said, you know, I had three births. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was, I was born three times. Mm -hmm. Now I think it's four. So. Let me allow to go back. <laughs> when were you able to? Finance yourself from what you are doing, what you were doing with a lot of passion and devotion. How old were you when you could live from the money you earned from being a photographer? Uh, very quickly. Yeah. Because when you're young, you don't need much thing. <laughs> it's not because I was paid a lot. <laughs> so uh, I was having my money. And other people doesn't have money at 15, so any money is enough for me. Mm -hmm. And then after I became selling a lot of pictures, I became uh, not rich, but I became autosufficient. And I became autosufficient all my life till today, and I hope I will stay like that. <laughs> Maybe not, but nobody knows. <laughs> And did it happen in real life that you had some financial instabilities as well, where you asked yourself, wow, how should I pay next month's rent? Or could you manage, again, let's go later to the definition of being an artist or not, but could you live from the work, from the photography work on a constant level? Uh, yes, but I have a, I have a, I had a very special uh, way of being a photographer and uh, being a creator or an artist in your turn. So uh, I always have uh, a, a commercial or journalistic work to do 
And then I was, with that money, I was doing my art. Mm -hmm. And uh, my art generates good money, but I don't think it's enough money. I cannot answer to that because I never lived only as an artist. Mm -hmm. And I don't trust that because being an artist is being, uh, for me, meeting a lot of people, thinking about a lot of things. So in my work, I meet a lot of people, and I meet a lot of creatives, and I meet a lot of very interesting people and very stupid people. But from both, you can learn a lot. You can learn not to be like the stupid, and you can learn from the creative that he has things to be a better creative. So I was doing commercial work, but I was not a, never a commercial because I added uh, a lot of uh, a lot of myself and my thinking and my creativity in any stupid job I do uh, because I'm a passionate. So I never worked for the money, but the money is also important. Like I don't think a poor artist today can can really succeed because unless he's a genius, I'm not a genius. Because communication and uh, relationships uh, uh, play a big role in your art. Uh, like it plays a big role in anything you do, not only in arts. Or and uh, uh, um, being, working in the field of photography all the time, and not being a genius, uh, those few things help you uh, think about your exhibition, help you uh, mature your thinking, help you uh, uh, go beyond the normal things. And if I can tell you, uh, all the experience I had, I had in my life helped me create today in a better way, you know? Like if I wanted to be the artist living in a, in a mountain and creating, I think uh, even Van Gogh, not Van Gogh, or Gauguin, even Gauguin, uh, when he was living in an island, somebody was selling him his art. So either you're a good artist with a good relation, where you, you, you are part of a society of art. Uh, I say art because this is a pronunciation. You are in a society where you play a role as an artist and they give you a role a lot of time with fake in both ways. Either you, uh, you create your art and you you trust in your art or in your creativity and you create things like me, for example, with meanings. Like all my exhibition had a mission. Like I did, never did an exhibition to show a nice picture. Mm -hmm. I did an exhibition to say something. So it's my way of expressing my thinking and my maturity mm -hmm. and my, my, my opinion. Mm -hmm. So if I may go in there, so you say you have two pillars in your life, like you divide between the art work, yeah, and you could divide um, another category, and this is where you say you have an income stream that allows you that kind of freedom to work artistic, artistically, artistically, yeah. right? So I think I found also the name of your company. It's the Minim production. Minimi. Minimi, Minimi. 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 production. It's Minimi, you know, awesome power. Ah. Minimi. It's Minimi production. It's my Minimi. And it's quite uh, well known here in the Middle East, as far as I could find on the internet. Yeah, it's, uh, it's well known in the Middle East. We work like, like I did a lot of work for all the countries of the Middle East, for the big brands of the Middle East and abroad also. And I, what exactly do you offer there? I, I create, uh, I have a, it's a print production, like we create our own imagery, or for clients, and we have a full production facility to create image. And uh, we have producers, we have touches, we have 
whatever, everything. And uh, this was very well known through the Middle East where the kind of things, I, I was a precursor in that, so I create all that. And I shot, for example, Sheikh Mohammed from Dubai, mm -hmm. the official picture. I shot the Queen Rania of Jordan, the King uh, of Jordan. I shot a lot of celebrities also, like big celebrities in the Middle East. That was another life. One of them. But uh, one of my lives. But uh, what, what I wanted to say here is that being free is being yourself. Like I create my, my, my artistic work the way I want to do it. Not the way the galleries or the financial want to do it. I compromise in my commercial work to a certain extent because I have a hierarchy in it. There is a creative, there is a client, there is a, but in my artistic work, I don't compromise. Mm -hmm. I think you raised a very, very interesting point, Roger, because like, what is art? We roughly spoke about it because um, as soon as you are financial dependent, which one has to say a majority of the artists are, either they have, when they were lucky, family with money behind, or good friends with money. But if not, they are relying on their own. And it's a market out there. So even to sell art, you need to fulfill the market's criteria. And then maybe your point comes up, when are you free to express yourself freely? So I appreciate what you said, like, you have apparently created your financial independency on one pillar that allows you, as you just said, yeah. to be artistically free. Of course, this is my system. Not, uh, but this is uh, this has a lot of consequences also. Like you don't uh, 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 put all your time to create art, so uh, you go slower with your art. But you do your art completely free now. Not all. Look, there is a lot of free artists who only do arts, but uh, not a lot. There is much more artists who are who cannot create art because of financial. So now all the business of art became a business and became with a hierarchy where the money exists on certain trends and rules. So they push the artist to to do more things. Maybe he's not convinced but because they want to sell it. So I prefer to do my commercial thing aside and know that it's my commercial thing and do my art because I want to express my art. You just said you try not to compromise too much when it comes to your art. Can you name an example where you had to go into a compromise the last time? And again, I think you are also um, be seen internationally. You're not just known here in the Middle East. Part of your work was um, published in, I think it was the Newsweek and the Washington Post as well, right? Yeah, all of them. So again, what was, it's if you wouldn't name. mind, tell me one example, when did you compromise for having your art being seen somewhere where you said, okay, this is freedom, it's liberty minus 2%? Never. Ah, I, just, I thought you just said, like, sometimes you have to go for a small compromise. No, you compromise in your commercial work. Ah. Not you in your art, because you have a hierarchy, you have creative, okay, I understand. you have a client, but in, your, in my art, I never do. How much time do you devote to your art when you're, as well, a businessman, even when it's a bit in this artistic field, what your company is doing? So how much time can you sacrifice for your creative artwork? I... I, sac I don't sacrifice. I put time on my art whenever I need mm. to put. Like, I think about the subject and I do it. But I'm very quick in producing my art. So... Uh, do you have an example for that? Yes, for example, uh, 4th of August. Which is a big day for those who don't know. It was in 2020, 4th of August, right, where the bomb exploded. And I think 300,000 buildings got Not destroyed. The bomb. It was an explosion in the port. Very important. I have to apologize. 
the explosion in, in the port, yeah. and 190 people died. 400 and people, 210 people okay, died. Okay, you know much better than I do. Where Beirut was destroyed. Mm. Uh, and if I may say so, it still is part of it. When I was working in, you can still see what happened because of the past. Yeah. Mm. So, uh, for this, I did not take a picture, and I was in the middle of it. And I don't take a picture because for me it was enough to accept and to document that. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, I, two months after, I was thinking about doing something because it was a major blast and a major event worldwide. It was the biggest, it was the biggest, uh, 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 not bomb, but uh, uh, no, I confused you. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was the biggest event. Explosion. In the explosion, yeah, it was the biggest thing, explosion uh, uh, worldwide. Like. I mean, I've seen it, it is next to the silos, and I think until now it's not yet clear. There's an enquête who was doing some, what it is, was about, why could it happen, and so. Um, it's incredible because when you walk through the center of Beirut, you can still see the consequences of the explosion, like shop windows are just gone. Yeah. Of course. So uh, two months after, uh, I I had to create something, so I create a positive thing. So I had a lot of debris from the explosion, and I shot them like a, in a studio, like a perfume. Bottle. Say again, you shot them in the studio? Yeah, I took with me, with my car, I, used, I put a lot of, I was turning around in the rebels and things, and collecting a lot of things like, it could be a, 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 a small glass or, or, uh, or whatever, or a lot of things. And collecting all them, and then I shot them as perfume, and it was, I shot I didn't understand, you shot them as perfumes, what did you Like, like you, yeah, sorry. I shot them like in a very beautiful way. Ah. On a white background. Ah, so in you the studio, them, okay. very well lit. Mm -hmm. uh, as you're shooting a perfume bottle. Ah. Or a fantastic model. Mm -hmm. And I created 200 images for the 200 uh, uh, victims of the Porto Blast. And this exhibition now is, I had to do it now, for the 5th of August, in Lebanon, in November in Paris, and New York, uh, uh, then London, New York, Korea probably, and other places. Wow. So it took me, what, one week to shoot this exhibition. So it's not the time you spend to shoot it. It's the idea I have behind, and I give it the time needed. Like I shot it on three different phases, and every phase was two days, three days, and I had my 200 shots. And I think it's a success, because I showed it to all the, the creatives, the creative directors, and, and they all love it. I don't know about it because I shot it and I'm very deep inside what I did. Would you call yourself an artist? I'm not an artist. <laughs> oh. I don't think I'm an artist. People has to define you as an artist. I'm a creator. I don't think artist is a, is a correct word. Like you have art and artist. Uh, what is an artist? It's a guy who creates things and said. For me, uh, people has to name it. This is art or this is not art. Who can defy the art? I don't know. Maybe there is very important people in there. But it's always superficial. It, it always very little in time. Because sometimes uh, what we call art will be in garbage after years. And sometimes what we call garbage will be a big art. So the name artist for me doesn't exist. People can say I'm an artist. I'm a guy, I'm a photographer who do things, who think about how to do things and who express himself 
in by photography and other tools, film photography or installation. So uh, artist is a big name, and I think it became uh, in this century, this time it became a uh, uh, subject to the financial companies, which is, I think, kill the creativity of people in a lot of in a lot of situations. Whom do you view as an artist in the world? Who I like? Mm -hmm. an oh my God, I like a lot. I love Andy Warhol, for example. Mm. I love Andy Warhol. I love a lot of artists. I, I like the Japanese art because it's, it's very intense with their culture. I like uh, I like a lot of uh, photographer like uh, like war photographer or ethnographic photographer. I, I love, for example, uh, 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 I love Cartier Bresson. I love uh, uh, Dan McKellen uh, and others. You said before that your I call it artwork. <laughs> For you, it's important that it has a message. What would you say is the message of your artwork? I go in because maybe that's already part of the answer. When I looked into your homepage, it said something like that the prevailing message is freedom, tolerance, respect, preservation, and some more. You said it. <laughs> it said. <laughs> said all. I think. I think uh, freedom, tolerance, uh, uh, is very important because nobody is tolerant anymore in this world, and nobody is free. Like, even a, a, a war journalist is not free because his boss can manipulate his picture and take it to another way and not the true way it was done with. So uh, I think uh, uh, everyone has to put his personality in his work. It's very important. Being uh, free is the most important thing in life. But you know, being free doesn't mean you kill other people because you're free. Freedom has values and have have limitations also. Now, uh, uh, when you talk about uh, when you talk about uh, the other uh, things, it's now you are looking into my little modesty yeah. book. Oh, no, now what, you're putting on the blue you, glasses. Become serious. No. <laughs> <laughs> what did you want to read in my notes? No, because <laughs> when when you talk about tolerance, tolerance yeah. is is everything in the world. Like mm -hmm. all the problem. All the wars are are from intolerance. All the oh, intolerance is the most, if you want, a problematic thing in the world. Because if you're intolerant, you create war with other religions, with other with other social classes, with other with your neighbor, with everything. So it creates conflicts. Tolerance means you have to accept the others. You have to help if you want, but the most important thing is to accept. If you accept the others, if I'm a Christian, I accept the Muslim, the Muslim uh, uh, religion, and the Muslim religion accept the, the Christian religion, or Jews and Muslim, or whatever, or Buddhist, or meaning we'll have a nice world. This world will become very nice and very beautiful. And why not? <laughs> why not? I just returned from a crazy day here in Beirut, and I'm overwhelmed. Hmm. There are so many problems here. It's heartbreaking and touching at the same time. 
because he can speak within just an hour to a refugee from Syria, begging little kids, taking their hands, little hands with the mouth, asking for something to eat. And then you see like tourists from Dubai, yes, they are still here in these days. And this is the totally contrary, money doesn't make any difference, they have it, they um, go to those fancy places. Because despite I've seen Beirut being also consistent of dust and dirt, you have the elegant part. You have suddenly fancy cars, the biggest ones. Yeah? So it's a very complex city. I do not yet know the rest of, of Lebanon. Uh, and very contradictionary so far as far as can I, I can see. So, I mean, you must know you. The war was here, it started in 1975 and it ended in 1990. Um, my grandfather in Germany, he lived through war. I remember when I spoke to him, he made experiences like starving, like losing home, like he had to leave home with nothing, just a little suitcase. Those are all experiences I l luckily never made. So you speak about tolerance, and you said you were 11 when the war started. What is your concept on how to increase the tolerance level, just in this region here? First, I want to tell you something about Lebanon. Lebanon is a very complex country. Despite there is 17 religions and blah, 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 blah <laughs> everybody says. I lived all over the world. I lived in France, I lived in Canada, I lived in the States. I lived, I, I, I used to travel the world twice a year. I'm only inspired in Lebanon. Let me tell you why. Because you have everything in Lebanon. And you have everything in Lebanon on very short distances and time. If, you, if you're in Lebanon, you travel from Beirut to 45 minutes from Beirut to the mountain. The variety of of greenery and soil and kind of of, uh, of of soil and rocks and greenery and things, you will never see it in the world on such a short distance. Like you have every maybe 200 meter a different variety of things. It make our our paysage not maybe the most beautiful, but the the, the most uh, psychedelic in the world. On another way, you see everybody, like you see the poor, the rich, you see the fancy nightclub, the fancy restaurant, and you can sit on a, on, on Genmeze Street and eat, uh, I don't know, a small sandwich at half a dollar. And even the architecture, like it's not clean, like it's dirt everywhere, and, and it's not painted, it's not new. This is what make our vision and our creativity wider. This variety of things on very short distances, and such a variety make you a creative. You know, let me tell you something. I was the, the creative director of the design district in Dubai and their ambassador. When I used to sit with the CEO, he used to tell me, how, who helped those designers in Lebanon and those artists? Nobody. They helped themselves. Nobody helped them. I said, how come? You're such a bunch of creative and designers, so well known in the world. We pay 
a lot of money in us as a government to create such a thing. Said, if you want to create such a thing, you have to create the environment. With it. Like, if I cannot uh, drink a beer on the street or or uh, I don't know, uh, put a tag somewhere and uh, don't have this different uh, uh, difference in architecture and variety in in everything. It's very difficult to create it. You can pay all the money of the world. You cannot create it. We never, nobody pay anything, and we have the biggest design and creative community of the Arab world, like the biggest from far. You cannot do any creative or design event in the Middle East without having the Lebanese on a big part. It's impossible. So all those create Lebanon. Yes, now it's very deep in the crisis. Of course, uh, uh, it's different. Now you are here with a huge crisis going on, political and financial and on all levels. But you will see how the people go out at night. Like they cannot stay home. They will go out, they want to live. The Lebanese people want to live, they like that. That's why we don't have a lot of terrorists here. They want to live, to drink, to live, to go out, to see girls, to see men, to see whatever. So maybe I didn't answer your question, but this is very important to understand Lebanon. And this variety comes with the positive and the negative. Like also there is a variety of opinion, a lot. And it will go on, and it is going on, and it will be better. Now, what was your question? I forgot. <laughs> um, I think I forgot as well. I was mm. so well listening okay. to you, so maybe this was the so answer. So it you. was not important. <laughs> exactly. Mm. And if it would have been important, it would have come back. Mm. What would your life be without any art? Can you imagine? Any what? Any art. I'm not an artist. <laughs> so my life will be the same. <laughs> my life will be without expression, expressing my, myself mm. truly and freely. That uh, will be a, a disaster. Mm. You want to sleep? <laughs> I was walking the whole day in Beirut, <laughs> yeah. um, but despite that I can feel some sleepiness, I just went back to the question I had before. I was, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I like what you said about the diversity of um, Lebanon and that it um, gives you some stimulation and ideas. And I remember now the question, what would be your approach to increase the level of tolerance here in Lebanon? I don't know. I created a t-shirt. <laughs> and I That's the correct response. <laughs> Is it the one you're having here, Kuku? No. <laughs> I created a t-shirt and an exhibition once uh, said, uh, uh, imagine war is over. That was the title of my exhibition and the, the whole thing. I think uh, the world is not tolerant. It is not a Lebanese thing. In Lebanon, you remove uh, the politician and uh, the pressure they do to create uh, uh, tension between communities, and uh, everybody will be tolerant. We are tolerant people. We are deeply tolerant people. Like, you meet a lot of people, you don't know what is his religion and what is. Mm. And then they put your religion on your, on your ID. It's crazy. Why the hell did I put my religion on my ID? I think it's the same as whether you're married or not. I do not think that um, it's of any uh, other's interest. Yeah. Are you married? Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> mm, there are some artists, I mean, now you're sitting next to me. And you look pretty normal, right? If I would have seen you walking by, except for your classes here, the fancy blue ones, right? Mm. They are extraordinary. But except of that, I wouldn't see that you're an artist. So what's your view on some people that 
create a brand out of themselves, that create kind of recognition effect, you know, that you can see you are from advertisement, that you can see with products, that is like a certain color, like magenta for telecom in Germany. It's a color that stands for that company. So I've seen it with certain artists that some people wear like just one kind of shoe, pair of shoes, and that all the time. So this is how they can be recognized, or some other things. I cannot uh, comment on other people. I will talk about me. Like everybody is free to do whatever they want. I think for me, an artist, it's not in the exterior uh, uh, way of uh, dressing. Uh, for me, I don't dress in a fashion way. I dress in a comfortable way. Mm, let me have a look. Yeah, I'm comfortable. <laughs> yes, you're very comfy. Yeah. <laughs> T-shirt, yeah. loosey trouser, and almost some sports shoes. Yeah. So I, I, I dress in a comfortable way. For me, I don't have to create a look to be an artist. Who give a... I was telling something. <laughs> so why I should have... Uh, uh, for me, being so much dependent on your look make you less artist in your work. For me, I'm not saying that this is true. So I dress comfortably. And, uh, and my art, I do it in a comfortable way also, but in a nice way. It's uh, here in the head. It's here in the heart. And it's here in the senses. This is what art is. I like that answer. Do you need anything, any stimulation, like sex, rock and roll, drugs, alcohol, to find creativity? Sex? Can be. I right? need sex, everybody needs <laughs> sex. But not to be creative. <laughs> I don't need, I can't, I can't function on drugs. It's impossible for me to function. Like, impossible. You think or you know? No, I know. I cannot function on drugs. It's impossible. For me. I I need uh, I need a certain uh, motivation in a way there is a tension in a story. Like I create a tension in a story. Like I did once after September 11. I did an exhibition about six veiled women who was everywhere in the world. And those six veiled women was from different religions. Everybody is veiled. Like the orthodox uh, 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 religious is super veiled. Like uh, in Greece, a woman who enters the, the church, they get their head. Like everybody is veiled. So why fighting the veil? Fight deeper than that. Unify all the people. We have all a, a, a center of interest and center of that can be unified everywhere. So uh, uh, I don't think people uh, are wise enough to think correctly. They, they, there is anger everywhere. This is not creative. Like, creativity for me comes from the street, from TV, from film, from books, from sound, from music, from everything. It's accumulation mm. of imagery. You, ac you accumulate and you, you, and you express it in a different way in an installation, in an image, in an exhibition, in music. So I need those sounds and I need those uh, uh, destruct, destruct, destructive mm -hmm. elements to be able to create. Not the drugs and go to another level of I don't know what. So this is me, other people. Like all the musicians, the big musicians were, were on acid and, and coke, so I don't know. 
How much are you in love with yourself, Hunter? <laughs> I think... Yes, I've asked the question. Not that I would say you, 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 you were, but I just wanted to know. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm not, everybody should be in love with themselves to be, to be alive. But I don't think this is my motor. I, it's the love you give who give you back. It's not loving yourself, it's very egocentric and it ruins you. It's giving, you know, who give you back. The more you love, the more you love yourself, and the more you evolve in your love. Imagine you love yourself, it's a, it's a, it's a circle. It's crazy. Imagine that. You turn, you turn, you turn. <laughs> but you have to like yourself and take care of yourself. Um, but I think the more you give love, the more you love yourself. You have two kids in a teenager age, so I assume you give them a lot of love. Who else do you provide with love? To then at the end, maybe if it's not even the purpose, but to receive back. Yeah, it's not the you give to receive, because whatever you give, it's meaning you have a lot. So, uh, I love my kids, of course. Uh, it's normal, I think. But I love, uh, I love the society, you know? I love to meet people, I love to exchange with people. I love uh, uh, any, any um, uh, if you want, uh, uh, a spont spontaneous incident or rencontre or whatever. This is what makes me, big, uh, give me a big motor in life. I love to meet people and to feel things and to, express myself and to communicate and, and uh, for me it's very important. Do you think art is a key pillar for society? I think art uh, and creativity uh, is not a key pillar, is a society maker. It's an art as a society maker. Yes. I think any society without art is a, whatever uh, important, it's not a society, it's not a complete society. I think art is a very good way of, of communication between people. You create something to let the people see and think about it. So it's a pure thing. And I think Anything in anything you do, and any society, art give it the the plus value. Whatever you good in mathematics, if you don't have the creativity in your mathematics, you will not be a, you will not create a, a atomic bomb or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> or a beautiful music piece to bring a bit more in the positive field. So, um, where can one see your art pieces next? Where will you exhibit next, Roger? Next, I'm exhibiting uh, pieces, which is a subject we talked about, about uh, the Port of Blast. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's going to be exhibited maybe online, not in a gallery this time, because The gallery I work with, which is Mark Harshen, is, is situated in the, the center of the city where maybe there will be a lot of uh, manifestations and things like that. So for sure we're going to do it in... In August, you mean? Uh, in August, mm -hmm. online or in the gallery, and in November it will be in France. In Paris? In Paris. Oh, j'adore Paris. À la place des Vosges. Oh là là, comme c'est beau là-bas. Ouais. Tu es vraiment de la chance. Hein. Mm. Peut-être que je peux être là. Bien sûr, tu dois être là. <laughs> Roger, it was really interesting talking to you. 
I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> you took an hour from my life. <laughs> <laughs> you you <laughs> gave me your love. Let's say like this. A lot. A lot. A lot of uh, interesting uh, communication and uh, uh, energy. Mm -hmm. I love it. No, I, I really do as well. And I'm very happy that we have decided to record our conversation <laughs> um, and to so be able to spread it a bit because um, I found it very inspiring. And as usual, I will think about the conversation afterwards. And I have to thank you for all the inspiration and some new starting points to make up my own thoughts. Thank you so much, Roger. No, my pleasure. That was a fantastic rencontre. Ah oui, c'est ça. Par hasard. Et c'est ça où il y a le hasard qui joue et j'adore. Mm -hmm. C'est mon moteur. Mm -hmm.